Okay, this morning let me ask you, do you know how to catch a monkey? <laughs> yeah? Or have you heard of or watched a video? I uh, recently uh, saw a video that tells about uh, catching, uh, how to catch a monkey. And it tells uh, me that native uh, hunters uh, in the jungles of uh, Africa have a clever way to trapping, catching monkeys. It uses, we use banana, it uses coconut, and they cut it half, and then haul it all out, and then in one of the half shell, they make a puka, make a hole, and big enough that the monkey's hand go in and out. And then the other half, they put an orange, and then put them together, tie them, and then hang them on a tree. And the hunters retreat to the jungle and just simply wait. And sooner or later, unsuspecting monkey swims by and smells this delicious orange and sees that it's inside of the coconut and it sticks his hand into the coconut and grab the orange and try to pull it out of the coconut. But of course it doesn't come out, right? The hole is not big enough to orange to pass through. But it keeps pulling and pulling. It rarely occurs to a monkey, to them, that it cannot have both their freedom and the orange. And uh, they do not understand that delicious orange becomes deadly trap for them. So while it's trying to pull the orange out of the coconut, the hunters simply throw a net over the monkey and capture it. How clever, right? <laughs> Likewise, the world sets us deadly traps that are just like monkeys. The world has been telling us that if we have more prestige, more money, more fame, more of everything, then we'll be happy our lives will be more satisfied, more meaningful. Under that illusion, most people spend their whole lifetime thinking, I must have it all. I must have it all. Not knowing that attitude, that philosophy, destroys their health, destroys their relationships, destroys um, um, their character, that is most important for any human being to live a meaningful life. That's why the call of Christianity is a lot different than the world. The world focuses on what we must have what I can have, but Christianity focuses on, we are called to focus on what we can give, what we must give. That's not only the commandments that our Lord Jesus says, well, you freely receive and freely give. But we want to give because of reflecting what our God has done what our Lord Jesus has done for us. And not only our Lord God commands us to give, to call, to live a Christian life in giving, but also He sends us what? The Holy Spirit who can empower us to live Christian life. That's what, in a nutshell, 
of what this week's study is going to be. And to teach us through the ministry of Stephen. And as you know, in early Christians, they grew so big. Daily, the Lord added the numbers into their fold, and they lived in communal life. And there were two Jewish sectors, I mean, two Jewish uh, newly converted Christians. One was uh, Hellenist Jews, and the other one was Palestinian Jews. And so, somehow, the Hellenist Jews widows weren't taking good care of. Therefore, what did they do? The, the, they complained to, uh, um, against uh, leadership. So, what did leadership do? They elected seven of deacons. There were it began the board of deacons, the ministry of deacons. That's when it began, right? And among them, seven of them, I don't even remember those names. And only two of them mentioned in the Bible after that initial e e election. S Stephen and Philip, right? And Stephen was the head of a deacon, and he played a big role in Christian service. So that's what, because he was, everybody, every deacon was uh, picked and elected and was uh, full of faith and filled with Holy Spirit. So that's what we are going to study this morning, uh, what has the Holy Spirit been doing how the Holy Spirit empowers Stephen, and how does the Holy Spirit still empower us to carry out the call of Christianity, to, for us to live a Christian life, for us to live a meaningful life, for us to have a life be satisfied, for us to focus on what God has in mind for us. Amen? And first of all, the Holy Spirit empowered Stephen to witness the gospel of Jesus Christ, to witness the gospel of Jesus Christ through his ministry. Let's uh, read verse 8. We just cut it. Uh, let's, I mean, the chapter 6 and 7 is all about Stephen. And we just uh, snapshot it. And let's read verse 8. God's grace and how did you lead up So, Stephen, man of full of God's um, grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among people. Among the people. So, what were the um, great wonders and miraculous signs that did he do? Do we know? Bible didn't specify that, right? And but we know from the chapter six and seven, we know enough that whatever he did, however he served, however whatever he did through his actions and words, the created who enemies, yeah. Verse nine says opposition arose right away and. Right away, then we know he was in trouble. You know, when you are different than the world, when you practice against what the world is teaching, you get to be segregated and you get to be um, harassed of your faith. And we don't know whatever wonders and miracles of sign he did, but we know for sure, that he was filled with power of God and filled with the uh, Holy Spirit and through his speech, he proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ boldly, unashamedly. 
and his wisdom no one could follow, and they wonder. They wonder where. You see the service, our service, Christian service, go in hand in hand with testifying Jesus is the Lord. The gospel has power to change people's life. And once we were sold to Jesus at first, we did that too, right? Now we kind of kind of slow down. You know, we are nice people, good people. We are faithful people. But sometimes we act like the car that is uh, transmission is stuck in neutral position. The engine sound impressive. The lights on and clean and even we have new tires and radios working, but it's not going anywhere. Not going anywhere. Because we are not sharing enough sometimes. And we need some motivation. We need to be reminded of why we become Christian. What was the purpose God saved us? What, how, why we were called? And what would be our great motivation to share the gospel with anybody? No, hmm? oh, because if I know I go to heaven because I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I know I love my family, I love my people, I love my friends. If I know they are good people, but they cannot go without receiving salvation, then I would to all, with all my strength, share the gospel, right? Yes, love. Because Jesus said in Matthew 20, Jesus said, I did not come to serve. I did not come to be served, but to serve. Why? Because he loved us. You see, love motivates us to serve, to serve in any way we can, to serve in while we are serving, we communicate God's love, we communicate God's grace, we communicate God's forgiveness, we communicate with others witnessing the gospel of Jesus. You know, right now, we are in great need of every, everyone's service in the upcoming our annual bazaar. Did you know that? And the Holy Spirit empowers us to witness if we are filled with the power, we are faithful, then we are not going to sit around waiting to be served. We are going to serve. We are not going to sit around and the others do double and triple and tenfold of the work. We are going to do something, right? The service Christian life go hand in hand service. That's what love does. Love is what? Self less. Love is not seeking, self-seeking, right? And love, you know, the being empowered by the Holy Spirit, last uh, few weeks ago, that we heard our youth, their testimonies of uh, the camp, right? And we were all amazed how well they spoken, how well they express their joy encountering the Spirit. And 
last Tuesday, I talked to Kaleo. You know, I said, I um, praise him once again. You did very good. And, you know, I've uh, met your parents before with uh, many other parents, so I cannot remember who they, they were. And, you know, I wish that they can come to church. And he says, right away, I wish them too. And I invited them to come because I was going to testify. And they said, oh, well, um, we are too busy. And, but I keep inviting them. I keep inviting them. And then he said something that touched my heart deeply. He said he invited them to come at least on his birthday instead of uh, giving him birthday gift. <laughs> he was willing to let go of his long-awaited birthday gift for their, his parents have a chance to hear the gospel, chance to experience what he's been experiencing. He says, my heart is full of joy. My heart is sold to Jesus. And his grandma testified that he's doing all sorts of uh, chores in the house. Nobody has to tell him anymore. That's he's doing, witnessing God's love and grace through his work. And little Katie can do like that. How much more? We've been in this faith journey how long? We all know the power of Christ, power of the gospel. Have we done great wonders and miraculous signs among the people? We try to witness to our community through our annual events like a bazaar or rummage or anything, the Thanksgiving meals, the homeless shelter, anything that we've got to do more. We've got to uh, be involved. Everybody needs to be involved in any way they can. Amen? Amen. And the second Holy Spirit empowers, empowers, empowered Stephen to imitate Christ-like love, Christ-like forgiveness. In you know, verse 9, from the verse 9, a position arose and he had to defend his faith, he had to proclaim the gospel, and, but heart and heart wouldn't take it, right? So it ended up, and in the chapter 7 at the end, guess what? He was condemned and he was stoning. Yeah? He was sentenced to death by stoning. In that horrible situation, people putting him, dragging him, putting him on a cross, in that horrible situation, he said something just similar like Jesus said on the cross last day. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing, right? They are not knowing what they are doing. Look what Stephen said. Read it. Stephen said, Father, Lord, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. Hallelujah. That's coming out of genuine love. That's coming out of, that's genuine forgiveness. You know, forgiveness equals love, too. If you don't love any, you don't love the person, you cannot forgive. If you love the person genuinely, you can forgive the person genuinely. And our Jesus Lord taught us what? 
to pray every day, our Father, right? Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And it has to be sincere forgiveness in order for us to receive God's forgiveness sincerely. You know, there is a story about a man who was uh, terribly ill and the doctors and nurses, uh, whatever they did, it didn't impact on his health. So he was getting ready to depart from this earth. So he remembered that he sinned with uh, his neighbor quarreling all the days of his life. So he called his neighbor to come in and reconcile each other, forgiveness, I forgive you, you forgive me. And, and then the neighbor was about to leave the room. The Scottish man called him, by the way, if I get better, all bets off. Call <laughs> still standing. You know, some people, it, it's a kind of a, um, a ridiculous um, example, but some people have a hard time to forgive others. And, but Stephen's forgiveness that we can really tell that he was about to die and he was wrongly accused. He was uh, uh, gonna led to a story to death. And yet, he said, but the Lord, don't let this sin against them. And then what? He was a uh, uh, broken and bleeding and blue, bruised by stoning and died, right? And he says what? He hmm? fell asleep. What a peaceful picture that is. He fell asleep because he knowingly did everything the Lord Jesus taught him to do and he completed his journey, faith journey, witnessing, and he has nothing to be afraid of death. Don't be always says this. I live a long and blessed life. I am ready to go. I don't care when I go. I eat whatever I want. I'm ready. You know, we watch uh, what we eat and cholesterol and this and heart attack or everything. Yeah? That's out of faith. They're ready to depart. You know, Stephen, verse 59, let's look at verse 59. Before he, he was uh, taking the last breath on earth, he saw this. And look! Right? Heavens open. And then he saw what? The Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Am I reading it wrong? 56. 56. Before he saw the presence of the Lord Jesus, no wonder, right? No wonder he fell asleep. No wonder he could forgive, let go, reconcile everything before he took the last breath. I believe he took the first breath, breath in heaven already before he took the last breath on earth. Our death may come, not by story, but by cancer, by tragedies, by unknown causes, but by natural anything, but if we live like Stephen, we can die like Stephen, with confidence, fearless of death. That's why you often see the faithful Christians, right after their death, you see their face, they look like just sleeping and just fell asleep. That's what, in the end, our Lord God, the power of the Holy Spirit, always work in our lives and empowers us to face death even with
solid assurance. Let go and let God. Amen? And then the lastly, that, that I believe the Holy Spirit empowered the Stephen to never give up hope. You know, we didn't read chapter 8. We finished chapter 7. And chapter 8, the open chapter 8, we're not done. Or verse 1, it says, Saul was there approving all this. Right? And we know Saul's conversion comes in chapter 9. Chapter 8 is about film, I believe. But chapter 9 talks about Saul's conversion. Now, can you kind of perhaps imagine that the Stephen's death had impacted Saul's life? Kind of did the legwork for his conversion. Perhaps Saul saw that horrible death on one man and going away. What on earth was that? Dying of a terrible death and yet forgiving those who tried, not try to kill him, kill him, and die peacefully. What was that? Right? I imagine, I imagine that Stephen, the Holy Spirit empowered Stephen to never give up hope of salvation, hope of the nation, to receive salvation. All those who witnessed his death, have been impacted. By the way, he died. You know, last Sunday, uh, missionary Andy Miko was telling us about witnessing his father's death and asking questions to his father that led him to become a missionary. That our death is not in vain. And the Holy Spirit was telling the Stephen, and even that last moment, empower them, never give up hope to spread the gospel, empowering. You know, it's easy not to give up hope when everything's going well. Our garden is rosy and Everything is good and no problem. My kids are doing good. My job is doing good. You know, we can be very hopeful. And my retirement is done, saved up. And we can be very hopeful. No need to lose hope. But when we look around, everything kind of boomy. Everything do not look promising. Then we start losing the hope in God. Many people, including me, you know, I have to confess. Lately, I was uh, losing hope, and I was kind of under Satan's attack, and putting my head down and walking and feeling depressed and defeated. You know, we try to build a multi-purpose building, right? And God has given this uh, vision to Paul Keller Ohana. I don't know how many years ago, and we still get it and get it, and we reduce the size and we reduce the materials, and we try to build a you know steel building. But as I look around, we've been working on it, and look around, our economy is not that great. Our Tisana's finances is not promising. And our membership is not promising. You know, our participation in the work of the church is not promising. And I said, well, what have I done? You know, I feel condemned. I feel punished. And you know, when something goes wrong, you always say, what did I do wrong, right? 
And, and I was walking around with Gongui. When I feel like that, when I feel depressed like that, I have tendency to eat a lot and ruin my shape. <laughs> and also, I know that I have to force myself to read the Word of God. Because the Word of God has the power. But normally, I would love to study. But when I am going down the hill, and I have to force, remind myself to read. Even then, I open the Bible, do I read it? Yes, I read it with my eyes and my mouth, but not coming here. When not coming here, it's not gonna affect my heart. But the Holy Spirit never gives up on me. And one day, I was reading like a judges. Who reads the judges, right? That when, I, when you're depressed. Um, the Lord led me to read, read the Judges, so I was reading Judges, so, you know. And then chapter 7, verse 2, I, the, the, the uh, passage just jumped at me. And he says, the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men for me to deliver Midian night into your hand. Huh? They, it's uh, when the Gideon is preparing to have a, a fight with the Midianites, and he gathered 32,000 men, okay? And the Lord says, it's too many. So Lord reduced the army and said, all fearful ones go home. How many went home? 22,000 went home. All right? And 10,000 on the left. But the Lord still says it's too many. Take them to the lake and let them drink the water. And, and then the Lord's going to tell who's staying, who's not staying. And 300 people scooped the water and left it. And the other all knelt down and drank the water like a dog. So the Lord says, all those let go. Only 300 will fight against the Midianites, and I will give Midianites into your hand. And he did. And he did. It wasn't a punishment that the smaller size getting rid of the, their, their power. Why did Lord Jesus, I mean, <laughs> why did God do that? And if that's in the verse 2, he says, in order for Israelites do not boast against me. Do not trust their own strength did bring Midian night into their hands. It was God's plan and God was set to depend on Him. Likewise, our strength, finances, and our numbers, we can boast. Yes, we did it. It can be our enemy against our trust, our dependency on God. When we go forward with God-given vision and with the faith, if God said, I will give it to you, and we need to continue, keep on believing, continue to keep on working. It may, I mean individually too, that you have dreams and you've been working on it forever. It didn't seem like it's coming. But Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3 says, it may tarry, but it's on God's timetable that God will deliver, God will provide, God will make it happen. So only thing we need to do is what? Do not give up hopes as the Holy Spirit empowers us to do so. Amen? Amen. So let us uh, not be complacent about pursuing God-given visions, God-given goals and plans for our lives, for this Ohana. Let us continue to carry out the Christian mission, God's mission, the call of Christianity, 
as the Holy Spirit empowers us to witness and to love like Jesus, to forgive like Jesus, to keep us always hope. As we do, we will see our faith grow, we will see our hope strengthen, we will see that our, see our steps, we see ourselves, we are making steps into the destiny that God has prepared for us. Amen? Amen. So let us gladly honor our God with our Christian service, with our faith. Amen? Amen. Until the very end. Until the very end. Why should we do that? Because we love God with all our hearts and minds and souls, and we love one another. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us pray.